I'm th uh, thrilled and honored to introduce Joe Tankersley, futurist writer and former Walt Disney Imagineer. Uh, I had a chance to talk to him a little earlier today, and he was asking me about the cars, and, and I'm saying, well, I want to listen to what you have to say. So it was a pretty uh, entertaining conversation. For more than two decades, Joe Tankersley helped organizations imagine and realize their visions for better tomorrows. Joe spent 20 years at Walt Disney World Imagineering, where he led creative teams on projects at Walt Disney World and Disneyland. As part of the Elite Blue Sky Studio, Joe established a strategic foresight program and helped the visions across the Disney company prepare for the future. Today, Joe holds up the unique visions of strategic uh, foresight consultancy. His international list of clients includes Fortune 100 corporations, major foundations, and nonprofits. His recent projects have explored the future of the workforce, retail, sustainability, public health, creativity, and aging. Joe has served on the board of directors for the Association of Professional Futurists and helped fund the Global Futures Forum. He currently serves on the advisory board of the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes as the founding member of Conscious Capitalism Florida. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Right. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's really a pleasure to be with you guys this afternoon. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, getting here was not without its challenges. I live in Winter Springs, Florida, which is a little bedroom community outside Orlando. And because I've had the experience of driving on I-4 to come to West Florida many times in the past, I decided I would be smart and come over yesterday. So I left yesterday afternoon, and the two-hour trip took approximately three and a half hours. But I finally made it to I-75 South. I'm driving down the road and I'm thinking, this is great, I'm gonna be there soon, when suddenly all of the traffic stopped again. And I was in my fourth or fifth you know, traffic jam of the day. So we were inching along a few miles of time, I'm sitting there honestly starting to get a little bit frustrated by the whole experience. When I saw one of those big road signs, we love those, right? The big digital road sign, and it said, congestion clearing before the big bend. And I got really excited. I was like, well, this is great. This is going to be over. My future is starting to look better. And the traffic continued to inch on. Another 20, 30 minutes, another sign. Congestion ending before the big bend. Now, this time, I am really starting to lose my patience. So I pull over to the edge because I'm in the left lane. You know how you do that, right? Just sort of peer ahead. And I'm looking up ahead, and I see the bend right in front of us. And I also see hundreds of cars. None of them are moving. Well, I never did see the bend. I did finally make it to Bradenton, though, thank you. But I did realize something very important from that. That has a lot to do with how many of us deal with the future. We see the signs all the time of what's coming. We see the inspiration that might help us better create our future. But if we don't understand the language, if we don't know what we're really talking about, then the signs don't do us much good. And so what I'm hoping to do this afternoon for you is to give you some tools and some techniques, some language, to think differently about the future. So hopefully you'll be better prepared than I was when I was sitting there looking at that sign. Before we start, a couple of confessions that I have to make about myself. I am a futurist. I still can't explain to my mother what that means. I never have been able to. I do not have a crystal ball. I cannot tell you the winning lottery numbers, and I cannot tell you the score of this weekend's Miami Florida State game, although unfortunately I probably can tell you who's going to win. But the point is, is that futures do not predict the future, unlike what many people suspect. My job is actually to work with you to be better prepared for you to create your own future. And I'm incredibly lucky in the sense that I got to learn how to do this with one of the largest companies in the world, the Walt Disney Company. And so I got to play in things like the future of motion pictures and the future of cities and the future of creativity and theme parks. And so I got to make all of my mistakes with them, fortunately. After leaving Disney and moving out on my own, I've had the chance to work with some incredible international companies, some incredibly innovative nonprofits, and I think they're really important for the future. And also, in fact, the world's oldest rodeo, at least the North American oldest rodeo last year. So I'm the guy that actually got to walk around for a week and go, this is my first rodeo, and I have the cowboy <laughs> hat to prove it. But the point behind all of this is, is that my effort, my goal is to work with you so you're better prepared to decide that you will be in control of your future. Because what I believe is what Alan Kay says. The best way to predict the future is actually to create it. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. Second confession. I am a completely over-the-top crazy optimist. 
I am convinced that the future that all of us can create can be better than any time we have ever imagined in the past. I don't care if you're an individual entrepreneur, if you run a small business, if you're part of a community or government, or you're just a person trying to make a better choice for yourself in the future. You live in an incredibly exciting time, a time when you have more potential to do more great things than ever before. Some of you are probably skeptical by that statement. I'm a futurist. I'm used to dealing with skeptics. And if I'm going to really be able to convince you that you want to change the way you think about what might be possible in the future, I owe it to you and to myself to really understand where that skepticism comes from. And I've been dealing with this for 10 or 15 years, right? Because anytime I tell people I'm optimistic about the future, there are always a few people in the room going, what about Armageddon? It's coming, you know? I had an experience a couple of years ago that really helped me understand where that skepticism came from. And I want to share it with you now. I was in Vancouver, British Columbia. I was up there, I'd been hired by a, a nonprofit group that was involved in communication on nuclear weapon proliferation. I'd spent three months working with some strategic arms experts. And you talk about people who aren't optimistic, right? And my job was to take all of the information that they had and they had created and turn it into some sort of experience that the normal public, me and you, could one, understand, and two, get engaged with. And so what we had done was we were pilot testing this idea to create an immersive scenario of the future where we would let people actually engage in a series of decisions to see whether or not they would blow up the world and what would happen given certain scenarios. We just tested it with a group of young college students, and I was debriefing them. So I was standing in front of the room, and they were all sitting there around, you know, everybody was excited. And I was asking them questions and talking about what I thought we had just done. And there was this young one woman right in front of me, and she was giving me that eye, you know, that look and she was sort of fidgeting. I figured one of two things. Either the tuna salad that we had fed them wasn't good, or secondly, she was not buying anything I was saying. So I just stopped and I said, well, let's not me talk. Let's hear from you guys. What do you think? And her hand went up and she immediately started talking at the same time. What right do you have to expect me to solve the future of strategic weapons and nuclear war? Everybody in the room sort of stepped back. We thought, hmm, this is interesting. She seems somewhat excited. But I asked her a few questions, we let the conversation sort of evolve, and it was really fascinating what I learned next, right? She was already responsible for solving climate change because she had to recycle all of her water bottles. People expected her to solve the problem of homelessness, which is huge in Vancouver. What were they going to do about the diversity issue with the, native, the, the indigenous folks of Canada? And by the way, she was going to school, taking classes where the information she was being taught was already five years out of date for a career that by the time she got out of college was likely not even going to exist. She had a point. Not only did she have a point, I knew what was wrong. She was suffering a disease. It's called future shock. Now, some of you have heard of this probably, and we've forgotten about it because way back in 1970, a guy named Alex Toffler was the first person to come up with this. And it's really simple. This is the problem that people face when there is too much change happening too fast. And that's exactly what that woman was suffering from. And you can understand why back in 1970, Alvin Toffler thought this was a big problem. We were going from working in factories to working in offices, and you had to have a college degree if you were going to get ahead. This crazy guy named Ted Turner started something called a UHF, yeah, UHF TV channel, right? And we went from three to four television channels, folks. For those of you who are young and never seen that before, by the end of the decade, we had cable, 12, 25 channels you had to pick from. That's mind-blowing. And if that wasn't enough, mom was nuking your food for the first time ever. And then there were these crazy futurists out there who were suggesting that at some time in the future, you would have a personal computer in your home. Wow, that's enough to make any person's head spin. You can see why they felt like they were suffering major disruption. Of course, fast forward to 2017. And if 1970 was a time of future shock, I'm not really sure what we call today, except future shock overload, right? I've got more remote controls than I used to have television channels. There are more platforms for watching video today than there were TV channels in 1970. And the number of channels, nobody even knows anymore. We can't even begin to keep up with that. That computer that you're carrying around in your pocket that you can't put down is a thousand times more powerful than the computer that we use to get men to the moon. That rapid change is amazing. And then, of course, we're not so much worried about whether or not we have a college education and a job, but whether the robots are actually going to take our jobs in the future. So future shock is real. Future shock leads to skepticism about your ability to even keep up 
much less be able to impact what your future may look like. But here's the problem. This is an incredibly dangerous, deadly disease. When we live in an age of acceleration, what we do is we give up. We quit thinking about the future and we only think about today. And that has serious economic impacts. Let me give you one example of just many. Anybody remember these? Some of you in the audience do, others people are like, what is that? I've never, this was great, right? Back in the 1970s and the 80s, you took your pictures on your vacation and this thing, a camera with film, you took your film in, and you could get it back in one day, after a while, even one hour, as opposed to weeks like it took before. It was an incredible move forward in terms of what we were doing. But of course, everybody knows the story of Kodak. 80-year-old company, one of the most successful companies in this nation, incredibly popular, employed thousands of people. By 2012, it had gone bankrupt. It had not been able to keep up what was going on. And here, of course, is the irony. Today, we take more pictures than we have ever taken before. Here's part of the story that you might not know. This is the world's first digital camera. It was invented by 1973 by this young man. Any idea who he worked for? the Kodak company, in their research lab. When he first showed this camera to his bosses, they looked at him and they said, have you lost your mind, son? We don't do that. Why would anybody want to look at a photo on a screen? We make film, we make chemicals, and we make the paper that you print the pictures on. And they said, that's great, go back to the lab. They owned the patent. They could have owned the digital world but because they could not imagine the future being different than the past, they let it slip by. Because they could not deal with the shock of change happening so incredibly fast. So how do we overcome future shock? Because if you can't overcome that skepticism, if you can't start to think you have some voice in creating your future, then you're gonna be the Kodak. Whether you're a small company, a local community, or just an individual trying to keep up. And the way we do that is really simple. It turns out that the best tool we have are the stories we tell ourselves about the future. Not all the data, not all the analysis, not all those wonderful reports that McKinsey and everybody else will give you, but the ability to actually change the stories we tell about what our world will look like tomorrow and what our role will be in that. And this is what I did. I'm a storyteller. And I have spent my entire career working with people to try to get them to understand that they can have a voice that they can be the author of their own stories. Now, of course, I didn't come up with that idea myself. I learned it from Walt Disney, and I may be old, but I really didn't work with Walt, right? But when I was working at Imagineering, one of the projects that I was assigned to was something called 100 Years of Magic. Some of you may have been there and seen it. And I actually had the chance to research Walt's life. And Walt was the original optimistic futurist. And I discovered that he really understand this, understood better than anyone the power of stories, particularly stories that are necessary to create our futures. So I'm going to tell you about one of the ones he shared. It takes place in the spring of 1955. Television, relatively new at the time. But on that evening, 40 million people, one third of the entire US population, was gathered in front of their television sets to see their favorite weekly show. At the time, it was called Disneyland. Later, it would become Disney's Wonderful World of Color. Some of you may actually remember some of those shows. What were they waiting to see that night? They were waiting to see a show that was called Man in Space. It was part of Walt's series of what he called Tomorrowland shows. He called them science factuals, shows that explored possible futures in the future. And this one was about the possibility, man's dream, as he said, to actually venture into outer space. Now, by present day standards, it was a kind of a wonky show. You, some of you remember that 1950s Disney animation, you know, kind of weird, kind of funny. There were silly little scenes where people tried to engage with aliens and tried to eat in outer space. But then they'd cut to Werner von Braun, who would be giving you a lecture on how rockets work and what space was all about. Fascinating kind of combination, something we would never try to do today. But here's what's really important, not the show, but what happened after the show. The next morning, the Disney Studios got a phone call from the White House. Apparently, President, Trump, Trump, President had been one of the people who was watching the show the night before. He said, hey, I got some generals I need to show that film to. Can I get a copy of it? And because this is 1955, they actually took the film, put it in a can, and mailed it all the way there, so it took about a week to get there. Two months later, they announced the first space operation for the US Air Force. 11 years after that, we landed the first man on the moon. 
And I remember that because I was a young child when that happened. I sat there watching that black and white grainy footage being sent back all the way from the moon, incredible experience that we were happening. And what I realized years later when I watched that Disney show, how incredibly similar the reality would become of the dream that he had created before. And so that's why, among everything else, the Disney company also brought you the first man on the moon. <laughs> but the point is that it took the story to inspire the people to solve the problems and do something that many of them thought was impossible. Many of them said, we have no idea how to do this. So it began with the dream. So my question is then, how do we begin to create stories that will work for you? Now, you've heard a lot of positive stories about the future, particularly coming from places like Silicon Valley and all of the sort of techno wizards who are out there telling you that we're gonna have all this incredible stuff in the future and everything's gonna be fabulous and it's gonna be great. That's not what I'm trying to tell you today. That's not the work that I do. What I do is actually use the tools of foresight and critical imagination to create stories that are plausible about the future, that will stretch you just a little bit, that will give you a chance to actually make that future true. And that's what I'm gonna talk about with you today. There are some specific processes that we use when we do this work. It's not all magic. It's not all something done in a tower somewhere. The very first thing is you need to understand what's really going on today. Sometimes you have to pause, look at the things that are really causing the disruption and creating future shock for you today and understanding what's really behind all of that. The second part of the step is you analyze all of the trends. And this is what futures do all day long. We spend our time reading research on this trend and that trend. But you have to go a little bit deeper than just what you see in the newspaper. You have to begin to understand what is it that's actually happening with the trends. And once you do those two things, then you can begin to imagine what is your preferred future, whether that's the preferred future of your local community, for a nation, for a business, whatever it is. And what we typically do when we do these kinds of projects is we will talk about different variations of that preferred future. But that then becomes what you set all of your strategic planning toward. So instead of your next strategic plan being in five years, we're gonna double the current whatever we're doing, you start talking about a strategic plan that is actually about the change and getting to that new world. So that's the big theoretical piece behind all of this. What I wanna do now is take you through some of the specifics to give you an idea of how that actually works. The first thing you have to understand is what are the driving forces? This thing, the computer chip, right? This is our life. We've had these long enough now that we have forgotten how incredibly significant this invention has become. The computer, the digital age, and the network that we came from it are bigger than any change we have ever had in human history. Bigger than any change that we have ever had in human history. I mean that, folks. And we don't think about it anymore because we live in it. We're like fish swimming around in the digital world. Let me give you a couple of ways to think about that. On the one hand, the computer is the next version of the printing press. You know, it's changed the way we communicate completely. Radically. So think about the idea is if you would introduce the printing press and industrialization at the same time, not 300 years apart. That's what has happened to us today. We're going through a dual revolution, one that is changing everything about commerce, one that's changing everything about communication. And as a result of that, we are looking at a world that is completely different than the world has ever been in the past. So that's what's driving all of this. What are some of the trends that actually begin to make sense of this, that you can start to use to your advantage as you go through that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through five, I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly, so put your seatbelts on. This is sort of a high level introduction to the idea of some of the things you should be thinking about. And what I want you to take from all of this is not that I have the answers, but I want you to start thinking about the things you should be looking for as you're moving forward through your day-to-day -day business. So there are the five trends I wanna talk about. First, always connected. We all know this scene, right? Is there anyone in this room who has at some point in time in the last 10 years has a teenager or had a teenager who has ha not had the conversation at dinner? Put that thing down. Anybody? Right? This has become in many ways the bane of our existence today for those of us who did not grow up with them. But I want you to understand that this is part about the learning process that we're going through. These devices, as much as they can be distracting, as difficult as they've been for us to integrate into every part of our life, are incredibly, incredibly powerful. I've been talking about mobile connected living for 10 years now, 
and occasionally I will talk to educational groups. Ten years ago, if I talked to a group of teachers about cell phones, everybody in the room was like, the mark of Satan, get rid of these things, they're ruining everything we do. Talk to a group of teachers today, and you know what they tell you is? The most incredible, exciting, best new device we have got to make what we do possible. So we're learning. We're figuring out how we actually integrate these into our homes. And one thing to realize, when you look at the numbers up here, that's in 10 years, because the smartphone was essentially introduced in 2007. And three quarters of the people in this country have a smartphone. Globally, there are more smart smartphones than there are toilets. And most people suspect that by 2020, something like 80 to 90% of the entire globe will have access to a smartphone. So you're gonna have them at every dinner table. And of course, it has changed our life. To a certain level, we now think about life as being what we capture, not what we experience. And there's some good sides and some bad sides to that as well. But everything that you think about if you're in a business is how do I facilitate people streaming the life that they're experiencing? How does that experience then be about relating to other people? But more importantly to me is the idea that along with that connection comes a huge explosion of choices. We can be connected with people around the world. We can be connected to any information instantly, right? This is the other thing. If you have a millennial and you're sitting at the dinner table and somebody asks a question, who was the star of that movie in 1973? When I was a kid, we all sat around and argued about that. Later, somebody would go to the thing called the library and find out. What happens now? You whip out the phone, you Google it, you got an answer. It's incredible in terms of how it has changed what we can do. And I'm gonna give you three, a few examples. All based on the idea that what we're doing is eliminating the middleman. I don't have to go to the library to get the answer. I don't have to wait to go to school to get the answer. I can get the answer immediately. And that's shifting many, many things. First of all, in education, a huge shift. How many of you are familiar with the Khan Academy? Most everybody's heard about it, right? Started with an uncle who wanted to teach his nephew mathematics. He started making some videos. He put them online. Today, they have 5,000 courses. They are, in many ways, reinventing education as we know it. A one-to-many model that didn't exist before. The idea of asynchronous learning when you want it, where you want it, where you need it. Udemy is another interesting example. Anybody familiar with it? Anybody taken a class from it? Have you taught one? Udemy is open to anyone in the world to teach a class. You can teach a class on anything you want to, and the classes there are everything from computer coding to how to play the guitar to macrame, you name it. And the other thing is, it's an open marketplace. You can charge nothing or millions of dollars if you think people will pay you for it. And it's become incredibly successful, and what we're doing is making people available education for virtually no money that used to cost tens of thousands of dollars. Philanthropy is another really interesting one. We've all seen the Red Cross uh, text donations, right? And that, of course, resulted in a huge increase because of the immediacy, ability to actually give money right then and there when you see whatever the disaster is. Well, there are a number of people using mobile technology to go even further. They're actually looking to connect you, the person with money, with the individual who has a need. And in many cases, they, what they do is they have a platform, they set it up and they say, okay, this person wants to start a business, they need 14 50 gallon barrels because they want to start a brewery somewhere in Africa, will you give them money? And you give them the money directly. And all the intervening, intermediary does is report on that. And they follow them. And they say, oh, by the way, person who got the money after a year, you have to tell us whether or not you actually used it to create the business or did you go out and you know, waste it somewhere? And that transaction, completely transparent, without any sort of huge structure between the two. And here's the key. They will report how successful they are. And their position is, is that in the next five years, you will discover that they are more successful in terms of actually getting money to people that makes change than even the largest, oldest, most established philanthropic organizations out there. Governance is another one interesting. Anybody familiar with DIY democracy? Have you seen this? I don't think you guys have it here. It started in uh, Minneapolis. And it's actually a series of coders who put together an app on your phone. You're driving down the street. You see a pothole. You take a picture of it. The phone's GPS tells you where it is. You upload it to the local city you know, cloud. And everybody in town sees that there's a pothole on my street. And everybody in town finds out when the pothole gets fixed. So next week, if it's still there, somebody else can take the picture. Completely changes the relationship between the individual citizen and, government, and the government. But it's not just adversarial, right? The other part of it is, is now government has a huge number of people 
who can help them do the work that they actually need to do. So all of this is about letting the crowd do the work for you. you know? And that is starting to expand across not just these areas, but actually into business and commercial applications. And anybody in this room who's in business can start to use some of these ideas. Here are some of the people who've done the best at it, right? YouTube, the largest cable provider in the world for all practical purposes. You know, literally hundreds of thousands, millions of programming. And until recently, do you know much, how much they paid the producers of those shows? Zero, nothing. People did it for them for free. Wikipedia, which among other things, put Encyclopedia Britannica out of business for all practical purposes, right? Those people don't come to your door anymore is run by people who donate their time and study after study after study has suggested that they are just as accurate as those big businesses that hired all of those people to actually do that in the past. I include Threadless because it's one of my favorite stories. Anybody know about Threadless? Threadless was a little small t-shirt design shop, right? They put pictures on t-shirts, they sold them, they weren't making a lot of money. Somebody got this cool idea. We'll have a design contest. We'll pick a topic, we'll call it cats on motorcycles. And any designer can give us what they think would be a t-shirt that would sell. And so they got all these designs in. Then they said, okay, potential customers vote on the designs. And the one that got the most votes, i.e. the most potential customers, is the one they made. So the designer gets paid something, a little something at the end to sell the t-shirt. Threadless has gone from this little struggling garage type company. They now own a huge former FedEx facility, and I believe it's in Chicago. Nobody knows exactly how much money they make, but there have been reports that it's probably in the tens of millions, maybe $40 million, and they have no more employees than they ever had before. It's starting to go mainstream. General Electric is one of the great examples if you're interested in how you might incorporate this into your own business if you're a typical established business. GE spends nearly a third of their research and development budget on what they call crowdsourcing tough problems. We have a problem, here it is. Anybody that can solve it will give you a prize for solving it. What does all this mean? What it means is we're starting to see the birth of a new form of entrepreneur in this country. Entrepreneurs who don't go to the typical places to find funding. They go places like Kickstarter, which is only one of 150 different sources where you can ask anyone to fund your project. And if you haven't been keeping up with Kickstarter, they recently got allowed to actually give money to just simply start a business, not to pay for a project, something you used to have to go through the SEC to do. People who are actually finding new ways to sell their project. Etsy's a great example. Any Etsy users here? As a buy or sell. Anybody sell anything on Etsy? Okay. The number of people who are actually using it goes up every time I ask that question. They went over a billion dollars in sales in 2016. They started out as an online platform where you could sell your arts and crafts, but as a model for what you can do at home with an idea, any kind of niche product that you might have with access to six or more billion people, it doesn't take a lot to actually make a living. So we're really starting to see how this begins to change the way we think about business. Trend number two, data, data, data. One of the things about the digital world is, is we create an awful lot of data. Now, I don't even begin to try to explain what those numbers are. I used to, and they make no sense, right? Let's just say it's way more than any of us could possibly imagine. And it's not all cat videos either. That's the point. A lot of it is really important information that we're actually creating and collecting. Where does it come from? First one is it comes from most of you. Anybody with a Fitbit in the audience? A few people, anybody had a Fitbit and given up on it already? Okay, this is, I, I just got the new one, right? An incredibly expensive pedometer. Um, but this is the Model T of wearable computers. The fact that it knows today how much I walk, that it might be able to measure my heartbeat more or less, you know, and occasionally it gets it right when I exercise, is nothing compared to what you're gonna see in the next five to 10 years. There are already people working on devices that can measure things like your blood pressure, your blood sugar, all of which, and then communicate that information immediately to your doctor, to your medical source. MIT has already created a tattoo that they can actually put on you that will measure your physical health, whatever parameters are, and in many instances actually inject medicines at the appropriate time. So we're collecting and creating a huge amount of information at the individual level. But that really pales in terms of where most of the data is coming from and where most of it's going to come from in the future. You've all heard of the Internet of Things, right? What does that actually mean? All of these devices actually collected. Well, some snarky folks suggest that it means your toaster might have a Twitter page. It might. But it's really not the key, right? 
In the future, when all of the appliances in your home, where all of your cars talk to each other and talk to the traffic lights, thank you, Ernie, and everything else that's out there, every part of a city knows what's going on in the rest of the part of the city, we are collecting a huge amount of information that is incredibly useful information, more than we have ever had before. So what do you do with all of that? Because one of the things about big data is it is meaningless unless you know what to do with it, right? And most of us can't begin to sort of go through all of it. It actually changes the game in a number of ways. In medicine, we will have the ability in the future to create personalized medicine for individuals without you having to go to the doctor. He can diagnose what your problem is. He can probably prescribe the medicines for you. You may not even have a human doctor for most of what's wrong with you. In cities, it is a huge part of creating smart cities. As we begin to understand traffic patterns in real time, we might actually get rid of traffic jams, and I might actually have been able to have gotten here yesterday in two hours instead of three and a half. That's an incredible movement forward. Education is also incredibly important because big data gives us the ability to create truly personalized learning and get that learning to people anywhere in the world, any time in the world, so we completely change the world that we're talking about. Blurred reality, number three. Welcome to the Matrix, right? We have been talking about virtual reality for 20 years. It has been in all of our movies. It's been a great horror story. It's been the thing that we have dreamed about. What's the reality? A piece of cardboard that you pay 10 bucks for, right? How many people have tried virtual reality of some sort? Then the number goes up every time, right? Today, it once again is just barely the beginning. But what is fascinating is, is that if you look at people who have had the experience almost unanimously, they're blown away. Wow. This is incredible because it is so immersive. It so changes your experience of whatever you're actually going through. This is what we think about in terms of how fast it's going to grow in the future. Right? And that kind of expansion means that it's going to get better and better, and it's even going to be more immersive as we move forward in the next five to ten years. So what's it going to affect? Well, already in entertainment, of course, that's one of the first places we think about it. Has anybody ridden the roller coasters where you get the virtual reality glasses? Did you throw up? There's somebody in the back. Didn't. Really, I think, it, I think I would throw up. But anyway, that, you know, <laughs> that's the obvious, using it to do what we've done in the past a little bit differently. But what the really interesting thing is, is how it's going to reshape entertainment. The, there's a, a, a theme park, if you want to call it that, called The Void. It's essentially a large warehouse where because you have a virtual reality system that you can actually move around, it's not tethered to anything, you don't need to build sets. You don't need to build all that elaborate stuff. I spent all that time working at Walt Disney World to help people build, right? You can do anything anywhere. The other part of it is we're starting to see a new version of arcades, virtual reality arcades, where you can play with people that you come with and it becomes more of a social type experience. So it's not just about sitting at home alone. Learning is probably way more important though, right? The medical uh, schools have already figured this out. It's expanding incredibly fast across medical schools because you don't have to have cadavers to teach people what to actually do when they touch and see those things. You can create an experience that creates muscle memory because that's what that kind of learning is all about. And having done it, when the real time comes, it's not about doing it for the first time. Think about what that means for people going into a war zone. Think about people who are going into disaster areas, that kind of learning that's incredibly important. And this is the really interesting piece of virtual reality. You might have seen New York Times has been doing some virtual reality work. And one of the first ones they did was called The Displaced. And it took you into a Syrian refugee camp and let you walk around and meet the people and, and experience all of that. Some academic decided to do a study on that to see whether or not it had any impact on empathy. And that started a whole series of studies. And there have been a number of them now that have been done. And here's the interesting piece. Virtual reality significantly increases people's empathy reaction to something. So if you need people to want to give you money, say, for your refugee camp, or you want people to have a better understanding of what it might mean to live in a low-lying coastal area, say like Bradenton, and have an experience that would give them a real sense of why they should be prepared for that next storm, there's an incredible power that is possible in terms of virtual reality, in terms of how we might change things. For all of the power of virtual reality, this is where I would put my money, something called augmented reality. Any Pokemon players in the, in the room? Nobody had seven-year-olds, right? Okay. So this came out last summer, maybe some of you heard about it. Uh, you took your phone, you ran around, you held it up at certain places, and you saw the Pokemon characters, and I have no idea who they are, right? And you were able to collect them and get score, blah, 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 right? You do see the numbers that matter. $10 million spent a day on this. Now, it didn't last very long, and that has something to do with the gameplay. 
But it's an incredible example of what you can do when you start to overlay new information, new experiences over the real world. You don't have to just be constricted. And this is some of the things that we're thinking might happen moving forward. Now, this is just assuming today's technology. And today's technology, for the most part, is your phone. Right? And just like that phone at the dinner table is an impediment to most kind of conversation, walking through the streets with the phone so I can see that there's a dinosaur walking behind you down the street is going to be an impediment to a lot of what we do. But that's going to change really soon. Anybody had a chance to see the Microsoft HoloLens? Hmm? What did you think of it? Cool, that's just the beginning, right, of what it is. It's actually a glass that you wear. You're not tethered to anything. You can go about your normal life for all practical purposes, but anywhere you, that has been programmed, you can actually introduce any kind of object. It can be data, it can be information about a product, it can be a complete fantasy land that you want to create. And here I think is what's most fascinating about that. One of the things that HoloLens is doing is something called Holo Tours. Imagine that you take a trip to the Colosseum. While you are standing in that place wearing your HoloLens, you can go back in time. You can actually relive what it would have been like in that place. And I think there's something really fascinating about that because I think as human beings, we have some interesting connection to the real world. We don't want to just live in a virtual reality world. But I think there's some really fascinating changes in terms of what that happens. Number four, maker movement. Everything in the future will not be virtual. This is sort of the interesting paradox, right, of the world that we live in. And it goes back to the beginning of the computer age. It started in people's garages. It started with people being hobbyists, building computers. Now, some of those garage guys went on to be famous, like the guys in this photograph, but most of them didn't. What most of them did was they kept doing what they were doing. They kept building, they kept working, they kept talking to each other, and what they did was they created a movement. In about 2005, they started something called the Maker Movement with Maker Magazine. They started having maker fairs. The most recent one in New York, over three days, had 250,000 people attend it. That is more people a day than go to Walt Disney World. Right? That's a huge number of people. And they've expanded from these kinds of fairs. They build everything, right? From these kinds of fairs to working in maker labs that exist. I don't know if you guys have one here in Bradenton or not, where people actually get together and have access to both digital and other types of tools. In schools, we have now replaced shop class with maker labs. We are re-excited about the idea of actually making things, using digital tools, using the real world to do that. And what does that mean? It means it changes how we think about what we do. Honest question, I want an honest answer. How many of you in this room have looked on YouTube to figure out how to solve your toilet? Right? All the time. That's not good for plumbers, but it's good for the rest of us. But that's a huge shift. And the question for you as a business owner is where do you fit into that paradigm? Can you facilitate other people learning how to do what it is you used to do for them? Are you now becoming a teacher? You know, and are your consumers now becoming producers? So it's huge shifts in terms of what might be happening there. Technology plays a role in this. Most of you probably heard of 3D printing. You know, the idea that you can print stuff, most of the time today it's out of plastic, most of the time it's silly little tchotchkes, but for 400, 500 bucks you can get one of these at home. Some of the folks that are developing are suggesting that these will be as widespread as a computer printer today. Probably within the next 10 years, we'll all have them. But what does that really mean, right? What can you do with this? Pretty elaborate things. One of the most interesting things from a manufacturing point of view, if that's what you're into, is it breaks all of the rules. Because you don't have to have a, you don't have to have a die anymore. You don't have to actually create something like that. And you don't have to worry about corners. It changes the geometry. You can make prototypes of new products in literally hours where it used to take weeks, months to do that. So huge new opportunities that are actually being made possible. But this is the one that really excites me more than any other. It's the story of a young boy, and I forgot where he lived, but there were some guys, some of those hobbyists, some of those makers, heard about this young boy who had lost his hand in some sort of tragic accident. And they thought, well, why don't we make him a prosthetic? They went online, they got the plans for free from one of the many places where you can do that, they created it using 3D printers. They sent it to him. He put it on, and it changed his life. And they did all that for free, just because they cared about the people that were out there. Really interesting possibilities as we move toward a maker society. What comes next? NASA's already been 3D printing food. It doesn't look like this, but it is actually edible. They've already been able to actually create the cartilage with 3D printing that they can grow organs around like ears. And yes, you can or will be able to 3D print a home in the future because it won't all be plastic. 
Ultimately, you can use any substance whatsoever for this possibility, and it completely changes the way we think about manufacturing and the ability of any of you to do things that it used to take a much larger project or a company to actually do. This is what all this means, right? Chris Anderson, who's probably one of the biggest proponents of this, we have never been in a world where an idea that you had couldn't happen faster, where it's really about what it is you can come up with here, you can make it happen, and that I think is really powerful. Finally, five, and this is the last trend, okay, so hang in there. I know lunch was good, right? Everybody's like, hmm. <laughs> thinking machines. The robots are coming. This is another one of our fantasies, nightmares, uh, dreams, it depends on who you are and what you think about it, right? We've been talking about this forever. The robots are gonna come, they're gonna take over our world. What does that really mean today? What's really going on? Most of them exist in places that are either dangerous, require an enormous amount of strength, they work best where they are able to do the same thing over and over and over again, freeing human beings from some of the drudgery that we actually work. Or in the case of the Romba, up in the corner there, making, getting, making it possible for my wife not to tell me I have to you know, vacuum the floors again. Many of you may also notice that the Romba, I don't know if you heard about this, also maps your entire house so it knows where everything is. So that's a whole other story. They're gonna to continue to do that. They will expand in that area in terms of taking away drudgery, taking away work that really truthfully people would probably prefer not to do. But the unexpected thing, the surprise in terms of what the future of robots is, has to do with how they might actually interact with us at a more personal level. Now, Japan has a huge issue. They have way too many old people and not enough young people, something we're gonna experience in this country in the next few years. So they're way ahead of us in terms of creating service robots. What they have discovered is, is that service robots, particularly for the elderly, are an incredible boon because people react to them in such a positive way. Think about it. It's really like having a smart pet, and everybody loves that. They feel like that the robot is interacting with them. The robot knows everything they need to know about them, and it really is changing that possibility. It also works for education. It works with people with Alzheimer's, amazing kinds of things that are actually potentially happening in the future with our robots. Now, this is the robot most of you are probably dealing with, even though you don't know it's a robot, and in fact, it's not. It's called a chat box. It's a piece of software. It's Siri on your phone. It's any of the other kinds of experiences that you have like that. And chat box come in a couple of different versions. The one on the left is sort of the standard one. This is for something called the chat box lawyer. It's a, it was created by a young guy, I think he was 16, in the UK. And it was, you used it to actually get out of parking tickets, right? And it's a simple menu, pick one, you know, it's a tree kind of thing, takes you next down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 16,000 people got out of tickets because they used this particular chat box. He is now using it to help refugees from some of the war-torn areas apply for citizenship. So you can do a lot with a simple kind of menu sort of thing. The one on the other side here on the, on the left is actually what's called an iterative chat box. It learns over time it actually gets a better sense of what the right answer is to the questions that you're asking it. And so obviously it can do more and more stuff as it moves forward. Right now, most of those chat box are used text messaging, but with six billion text messages a day, there's an awful lot of business that we can actually do using chat boxes. And here's the prediction of what that will be in the future. Most of the customer service reps in the world may be replaced by a piece of software in the next 10 years, or at least that's a possibility if we choose to go that direction, which once again, releases us from some of the work that may not be the best work for us to be doing, and we actually automate it. But this is just the beginning. How many people have an Amazon Alexa or a Google Go Home right now? It's like, I bought one. Yeah, I use it to listen to the radio. It's kind of silly. Once again, it's just the tip of the iceberg. This is a smart device that the more you talk to it, the more you interact with it, and yes, the more the Roomba tells it where you are in the house and what's going on, the more it starts to create an ecosystem and really understands what's happening in your world so that it can begin to ultimately anticipate your needs and actually solve problems for you before you have those problems. You can create an avatar for you in a few years so that you don't even have to answer all of your email. It does it for you and it does it a better way than you do. It knows which emojis you're gonna send out, right? Huge possibilities as we start to be enhanced by the use of automated devices that aren't gonna take away our jobs, that aren't gonna replace us, but are in fact going to be there to help us do incredible things moving forward. Wow, everybody takes a deep breath, right? Fire hose is over, that was a lot of stuff. What do you do with it? That's really the question, right? Because if I just show you all this stuff, you go, well, I could have read Wired Magazine. I didn't need to waste an hour with that guy. What I want to do is talk to you about how you actually change all of that. 
And here's the most important thing, particularly if you're in business. Don't bank on any one trend. The future is based when you find the unique combination of those trends that nobody else has thought about before. So go back and think about how they relate to your business or your government or your nonprofit and think about how you find that interesting intersection that comes together with all of that. And when you do that, you look for a theme. And this is the theme that I see in all of the trends that I've talked about today. And that is an incredible amount of empowerment. What I see in all of the digital new technologies and all of the things that they have spawned is the ability of individuals, small businesses, entrepreneurs to accomplish things that we just could not have done 10 years ago. And I think that's what's incredibly exciting. So once you define your theme, and maybe yours is something different, maybe you don't agree with me in terms of what the theme is, that's where we get back to this critical imagination piece. You can't just dream up something wild and crazy. You have to come up with a story that makes sense a story that pushes the boundaries. Hey, let's put a computer in everybody's home. Sounded pretty crazy, but they had a plausible reason behind it, right? Hey, let's get rid of the cab industry by having this little app that we can actually have people call and they can get cabs. It pushes the boundary, but it's based on something. Now, actually creating these stories takes a lot, much longer than the 45 minutes we've got here this afternoon. And you have to get really deep into all of that. So what I want to do is maybe just give you a hint of the kinds of things you might think about by giving you sort of the headline of some of the ones I've worked on in the past. For instance, a story that I recently did for the Florida Council on Aging. This is, uh, let's say, Jack and Celeste. It's their story. They're 72 years old. They live in a senior cooperative housing with others, eight or 10 other couples like them. And because they have robots and because they have connectivity, because they have all of those kinds of digital tools, they're able to extend the number of years that they live independently by possibly a decade. That's incredibly important when you realize that 87% of the people over 70 years old want to continue to live at home. They don't wanna go into an assisted living facility. And for those of you in government, you know that keeping people at home and keeping them reliant at home is the only economically efficient way to deal with the huge silver boom that's gonna be coming in the, in the future. Or maybe it's Sammy, we call him the two-wheeling grocer. This is a story that I created one of the largest um, food companies in the world, right? To look at how we might actually re solve the problem of food deserts in urban areas. So imagine for a moment that we take all of that power of big data and instead of thinking about it being only the province of someone like IBM, we give it to a local community. We give them access to all of that information, all of the sensors that are out there, so that it is possible to know that moment when that grocery store is getting ready to throw away all of that food that's still edible, but just doesn't meet their standards. And Sammy knows about it and he shows up and because he's got a connected a group of customers behind that, he's able to get that food to those people. He started a business, those people are getting better food and everyone's winning across the whole platform. Or finally, maybe it's Andy. This is my digital Da Vinci. This is for a book that I'm actually writing right now, a series of stories like this. And what I imagine she does is use all of the tools of connectivity, virtual reality, augmented reality, and is what I would call a polycareerist. She's able to create a life pursuing those things that she loves the most. Whether it's art on the one hand or working in a co-working space at the same time, which many of us are already starting to do, or rather it's the ability to think about completely disparate things. And she does so much of that because she has a personal smart assistant that takes care of all the back of house work that you used to have a, have a huge business behind all of that. You are gonna create your own stories. They're gonna be completely different than mine, but hopefully that gives you some very brief sense of how we actually do this. We make them real. We make them about our neighbors. We make them about ourselves. So I worked at Disney for 20 years. One of the things that happens when you work at the Walt Disney Company, and many of you may have this experience, right, is you see an awful lot of quotes from Walt Disney, some of which he said, others he didn't. This is one of the most popular ones. And most of the people that I worked with over the years really got excited about the do it part. You know, that was what they thought the quote was all about. We can do anything that we think, and once we think it up, and so they were doing the impossible. For me, it's really more about the dreaming part because I'm a dreamer. You can't do anything different if you don't start by dreaming it. And that's my job, is to help to inspire you to have those dreams. But I can't do it alone. It takes the doers to actually create this future. And I don't wanna be the guy who just shows up and says some stuff and everybody goes, that was interesting. I want you to go out and be inspired to do something. So what I wanna do is ask you guys for a favor. If anything I've talked about up here today 
inspires you to think differently about the way you're going to run your business or your government or whatever your community that you're working in, I would love it if you would come up to me afterwards, take my card and send me your story. Because one of the things I do is I'm collecting stories about the future and those people who are actually making them difference. Because the more we do that, the more we see this as real and as a possibility, then the more likely we are to create those futures. The other thing is, if you know other doers or even other dreamers who you think might be inspired by some of this, please come get my card. I'd love to talk to them. I love to do this because I think it's so incredibly important. A final word. I warned you in the beginning, I am a completely nuts optimist, right? Off the charts. That doesn't mean I'm naive. I know that we face a lot of really serious issues in this country, in our towns today, in this state. And any time I would work with anybody, we certainly address all of those. And I would recommend that what you do, if you take any of this to heart, and if you go back with your group and start to think about what your stories of the future are, you certainly address them. Don't create stories that are about utopia because they're really not useful to anyone. What's useful to the stories is you need to think about them as if they were a map. And when I say map, I don't mean Google Maps. I mean this kind of map. And I love this map. This is so exciting, right? This is from, I think, the 14th, 15th century. And if you look at this map really closely, what you see is fascinating, right? Where the map maker lived, a lot of detail. If you were using the map, you'd probably recognize those places. Head out to sea, starts to get a little sketchy, get far enough and there are sea monsters and dragons out there. Go too far and you probably just fall off the edge of the earth. This is a real map. Hundreds and thousands of people got on little rickety boats, sailed out into the unknown and created our world that we live in today. They created the future. Why? Because they were inspired by the stories that they were being told about the possibilities. And that's why this is so, so incredibly important and so powerful. Now it's up to you. Your future and more importantly, my future and our future will be created by the dreams that you have. So I can only ask that you dream boldly, be excited, and if nothing else, know that you have more power to create your future than at any time in the history of human race. Thank you very much. And because I actually finished on time, amazing, I know, I'm told we have a few minutes for questions if anybody wants to ask any. So, any questions? Up here in the front, uh, he has a right here. microphone. Here you go. How do you feel about industry disruptors like Uber, Lyft? <laughs> there will be winners and losers. There always are. You know, the interesting thing for people who are in established business is that Uber, part of Uber's success was they said, we don't believe the rules apply to us. That's a really interesting challenge about this digital world that we live in. The other thing, though, is to understand that Uber would not have been successful if the existing business hadn't been satisfying their customers. You know, those are the two things that I think are really important. The question is, how do you, how do you allow innovation in a way that makes sense, but you don't suddenly destroy a, a traditional industry? And I, that's up to government. That's up to you guys to, to sort of figure that out. And it's a challenge, I think. Right here. Hi, um, reading a book uh, by Kevin Mitnick called The Art of Invisibility. In one chapter, he says, you have no privacy, get over it. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the future of uh, privacy versus uh, interconnectivity. How many people got the email from Equifax? Isn't that what it's again, right? Yeah. yeah. There, I mean, it's pretty obvious that you know, somebody out there somewhere knows everything about you. Um, we don't have any privacy. I, the, we don't, at this point, as far as I can tell, have a good answer to that, to be honest with you. We don't know how we're going to feel about that. One of the real potential challenges that exist is the possibility that we will give up all of this because something will happen and we will have an emotional reaction that says, we're just not going to share anymore. The flip side of that is, if you're a business and you want people's data and you want to be successful, then the way you sell yourself in the future is that you are going to give them an ironclad guarantee that you will protect them. That's the key. You look at a company like Disney, incredibly successful with some of their rollouts to start to collect people's data with the wristbands and things like that because people trust Disney. So trust is going to be a huge part of solving that problem in the future. It's never going to be perfect. But then again, we've always had crime, right? I mean, it's not like it's something completely new and different, but it's a challenge. Fair one. Any other questions? There we go. 
Hold on one second. So, Joe, when we were talking earlier um, before this, uh, you were talking about cities of the future. You talked about these five trends. Um, as an optimist, how do you see our cities of the future? Well, I think there, there, all of these tools obviously can facilitate that. We certainly have the ability to create cities that are way more livable than we have today. You know, it's interesting, I, I walked around Bradenton last night. Uh, and the area downtown that obviously had been sort of abandoned for a long time is starting to come back because you're starting to get the people here. If you start to give them the tools that they need, the interconnected, the, the high-speed Wi-Fi, things like that, where they can actually come live and do business here, you will see a new generation that wants to live here. Um, Tony Hugh, who runs a company called Zappos in Las Vegas, has really got an interesting model for that. He's a you know, rich internet billionaire, so he can do whatever he wants to. He set his company up in the old part of Las Vegas, the part that had really been run down. Uh, and he essentially is creating something he calls Zapotopia. Uh, they are creating a city. And what they're saying is, as a business, it's not just about me finding the cheapest place to do my business. It's about me helping to create the community that goes with it. So I think that's a big part of it. I think, it's how we, I think we have to think differently about what it means to be a city and who really gets something out of it and the involvement. Don't know if that's a fair answer or not, but I think there's a lot of possibility there. What do you think when, when discussing the future and all this, when discussing the future and all the great stuff that it's come, do you think businesses will have to go back to like when they push all this stuff, it gets really good and then you have to go back to the basics. Do you think there will be a need in the future for it to go back to basic business practices because too, technology becomes too much? Well, I'm not sure that this is an answer to your question, but I would actually say that all of this technology requires businesses to remember that each customer is uniquely valuable because when you know, when I can know everything about you, if I don't respect that, you know, if I don't try to sell you what you want, you're going to go someplace else. So what, I don't know that when, when, I'm not sure what you mean by basics, but I don't think it means we need to do something completely different. What I think is, is you're gonna find a much more personal relationship. Big mass marketers, big mass commodity companies are the ones who are at the greatest risk in a world that's incredibly personalized. Anybody who can come along and say, I know what you want, I know when you want it, and by the way, I'm gonna tell you when it's here, I think are probably the, the people who are gonna be most successful in the future. You got time for one more? One more question right there. With the uh, rise of technology and all these innovative business practices and kind of exciting technological gains, I think it's often easy to forget how as much as technology is rich and so has inequality and so has in unequal access to economic opportunity. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of envisioning a future, how you can want, create one that's equitable and one that also recognizes uh, deeply systemic problems that are built into our system. Good question. Not an easy one to answer. Uh, the second story I, I referenced, the, the idea of the local community having access to big data. One of the things we have to do is we have to change the current paradigm, which is technology trickle down. Right, starts in Silicon Valley, the rich people get it first, and then 10 years from now, everybody else is gonna get it. We need to change that model. Uh, and one of the interesting things about it is, is, is the price of digital technology gets almost to zero. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know, the new iPhone costs a thousand bucks, you can get one for a hundred that does everything. You know, and there are people making those. So we need to get that technology in the hands of everyone. I think if we do that, we can solve some of that inequity problem, but not all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, we'd like to thank you if you stay here for just one okay. second. And we, do, um, we do want to thank our sponsors for the event uh, today, Kaiser University and the Mosaic Company. Uh, we appreciate their ongoing support to uh, enable us to bring these important events to our members and guests. And Joe, as a, as a special gift for you, being here today. We'd oh, like well, thank to you. Present this to you. <laughs> thank, so you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you all for attending today. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you.